Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 20 and some things to talk about today, some uh, numbers which are a little uh, fuzzy unfortunately for Nebraska uh, and some possible ways out of this mess. So I start my day, it's kind of like Groundhog Day, get up, uh, read the paper, or see what uh, our mayor and governor, or see what the plan is, uh, if we've got one. Uh, then I look at the websites, the Johns Hopkins site, for example, the state health department, local health department, update the spreadsheets, and kind of see, put those all together to see how are we doing as a, as a community, as a state, and how do we compare to New York and the United States. And so uh, kind of mixed messages, unfortunately. Uh, United States, uh, our testing rates in Nebraska are starting to catch up to national averages. Our Community hotspots are actually uh, like, you know, Sioux City, Lexington, Grand Island are getting testing rates even higher, which means we're putting resources where they need to be. Unfortunately, it looks like our population percent that's testing positive is, is as high or higher than New York. Uh, and so this is uh, unfortunately uh, that some of our communities didn't do as well as you we might have hoped. Uh, hopefully it doesn't keep spreading. Uh, unfortunately, we're a little uh, off on some, some data lately. Uh, Right now, we're, we, we did open things up a little bit in Lincoln. We don't know for sure whether that is, the next week's numbers are going to be as bad. Uh, we only have a partial week so far. We also have seems to be a little bit of a drop off in the number of tests being done. Some people may have saw it, seen in the paper that Test Nebraska has having some problems. They didn't quite uh, plan the rollout as, as well as they should. They didn't uh, incorporate uh, the health departments and the physicians in the rollout. And so some health departments aren't getting their numbers back, which makes them wonder what's going on. A lot of physicians aren't able to get any test results on their patients through Test Nebraska. So hopefully they'll start getting those bugs fixed out so we have a better idea of which, what our trajectory is uh, here in Nebraska. So I also get articles forwarded for me all the time, people saying, well, is this guy right? So this is a good doctor from Pittsburgh. I don't think the headline accurately reflects his news conference, which I did go ahead and watch. He does uh, say, make some assertions about influenza. May, this may be not being that much worse than influenza, but he, I would say he's wrong on that. And he didn't really provide any data backing that up. So in science, we always try to calculate the numbers and, and show our work. And so this is what I've done is basically said, you know, one best case or one scenario we have, this isn't a extrapolation. This is actually what has happened. If we take the population of New York City and say how many people died and assume that 100 percent affected were infected, which is not, there's a, the case, the infection fatality rate is at least 0.24 percent for, for coronavirus. If we extrapolate that to, to these communities, Crete, Lincoln, the state of Nebraska, the United States as a whole, those numbers are far worse than influenza. So just using this lowest case scenario possible, 0.24 percent of New York City, that's 800,000 facilities in Nebraska if they have. If, in the United States if they have a New York experience, which is way worse than annual influenza deaths of 12 to 61,000. We can extrapolate back from German case fatality rates. They have the highest and probably most organized testing rate of most countries. Uh, case fatality rate though is higher than actual because that because there are always still going to be cases that aren't identified. There's going to be asymptomatic cases that aren't tested. So the number is going to be lower than that. Most experts think it's in this 0.5 to 1%. And if you look at the antibody testing in New York City, which was about 25% of people being infected in many uh, boroughs, you could actually get about 1%. So it looks like this is probably the case. Now it could be the case that I've made a mistake in my numbers and that's why you always in science see if anybody else can, has other uh, numbers that are very similar to yours. Uh, in Health Affairs, they did publish an article last week, which actually did, in fact, do that. And they are estimating uh, symptomatic infection rates of 0.6 to 2.1. Quite a wide range yet, but they also use county-level estimates, and counties vary from, from county to county based on their demographics. So just like that Pittsburgh doctor, he did talk about, the, for example, the difference between the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which probably had a lot of older pop passengers as opposed to the aircraft carrier, uh, which had many younger pa passengers because they're young, healthy sailors, I would hope. Uh, our counties are kind of like that, though, too. So you may have, like, you know, College Station, which is a, you know, a college town. Uh, it's not going to have, it's going to have a lot lower fatality rate because it's got a lot of young, healthy people in it. But you may have a retirement community, it might be a bit higher. Well, the other thing they do talk about is, yes, this could, this is probably a little bit of an overestimate. Uh, so they use the Diamond Princess Cruise, for example, where 20% of people were infected but didn't have any symptoms. So you have to correct for that a little bit, too. So they had, uh, suggested dropping this down by about 20%. If we run those numbers and apply it to the population of United States, Nebraska, or Lancaster County, this gives us something to work with. With uh, these numbers are too high because this again, this would assume that 100% of people are getting infected, which which is not the case. 100% of people will not get infected. Will hit herd immunity uh, immunity before that happens. Uh, we what is herd immunity though? It's probably somewhere in the range of 54 to 82%. There's a calculation you can use the R that I've seen is between 2.2 and 5.7. And so we'd have to, to have herd immunity, we'd have to have 54 to 82% of the population infected. So if we use the upper, lower range, 
we're talking about anywhere from four to 45,000 deaths in Nebraska if we go to herd humidity without doing anything to stop it, or 700 to over 7,000 deaths in Lancaster County if we don't do anything to stop it. Uh, another way to look at it, though, you know, it's not as infectious as measles, for example. Measles herd immunity is up in the 90-95% range. That's why you need everybody vaccinated for measles. We won't get to herd humidity, and there's things we can do to, to, to affect how this spreads. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit more about for the rest of this is what can we do to make this not happen uh, short of uh, closing everything down for months and months. Uh, also, if you want to do any of your own biostatistics, I'd recommend going to Coursera. Uh, John McGreedy from uh, Johns Hopkins, who is my uh, stats professor, is one of the best professors I've ever had. Uh, he has this course online that you can take yourself for low cost if you want to learn this stuff. So uh, one question right now is what is our plan for Nebraska? And I literally don't know what it is because it looks like we've thrown out the National Governors Association, Johns Hopkins and Harvard plans. Uh, so what is the plan going to be? Uh, hopefully our plan has some balance. Uh, we do know now that, that our uh, fatality ranges could be pretty wide, could be bad if we do nothing. Uh, although we do, of course, have to balance the uh, income and, and effects on our economy and the educational losses from our kids. We do need to find a way to get our kids back to school. How do we balance these? Are there other way, things we could do short of uh, what we're doing right now? Good news is yes. Uh, so we don't have to stop infection to zero. Uh, if you uh, went through this uh, a few uh, a week or so ago, we talked about this. R doesn't have to go to zero; it just has to go to less than one. And some very simple interventions can get it there if they're used by everybody. Uh, so think of this as uh, like layers of Swiss cheese. Nothing's going to be perfect. Uh, washing your hands or a cloth mask—they're not perfect, but each of them, when layered on top of each other, can literally stop spread in a community and stop a pandemic. So a uh, great article two days ago from Atul Gawande talking about how essentially they did that to prevent the hospital workers in Boston from getting infected. So they treated you know, thousands of cases, but actually had very low infection rates of the doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists by bas just basic things. Most of the time they didn't use N95 masks unless they were in a patient room who's actively coughing, but walking around the hospital, they actually used basic ma surgical disposable masks focused on ha hand washing, physical distancing, and they were able to make a very uh, low uh, infection rate of the workers despite being around lots of coronavirus. A couple things he, he t that are worth uh, noting is that the, he, for example, mentions a study in a military boot camp where they simply made the recruits wash their hands five times a day. That cuts spread of respiratory infections by 45%, that alone. So when you're walking in and out of places, wash your hands, wash a couple times at work, that actually can make a pretty big reduction in spread and uh, we need to have better habits around hand washing. He talks about uh, need, the need for a mask. And so uh, basically they've done studies. And again, it was uh, with military recruits. They actually put Petri dishes on the floor and sa saw how far bacteria spread when people were talking versus coughing, for example. Most of the time, even three feet was enough, but six feet occasionally. Uh, so if you're just normal person t talking normally and breathing normally, you're fine. The problem though is if, if you are to sing, yell, cough, or sneeze, it can spread much farther. A sneeze can spread as much as 20 feet actually, but all that would stop if you simply wore a mask. And so the, the whole thing is that any simple mask, even cloth mask, would probably be very effective on limiting the spread and keeping this spread all the way out to here if you're infected. And the problem with coronavirus is you're often infected for three to four days before you realize it. So wearing masks would be very, very effective. Uh, and even if 60% of the population wore masks, it could probably be effective. Uh, Austria has had a huge drop in its cases, but they have compulsory mask wearing. I'm not sure if Americans would be amenable to doing that. But if we can at least get more than 60% and get close to 90%, it's a lot like wearing seat belts, actually. We've known forever that seat belts save lives. We're probably getting 80, 90% of Nebraskans to wear seat belts. Not everybody, but boy, has it made a difference. So could we have the same thing? Instead of click it or nick ticket, will we have mask it or casket? Uh, we do need to get people to start wearing masks. Uh, you're going to see a lot of public education coming out from clinics, the health department, uh, the hospitals all saying, please wear a mask. We do know this works and the study is really solid. Uh, I don't know where these ideas are that masks will somehow empower your health. That's not true. Um, also, though, we have to think about other things. So when we bring kids back to school, when we give people back to direct restaurants, this is still a problem. So this uh, from Aaron Bromage's article about one person infecting all these people within a restaurant uh, just because of the circulation and airflow in a confined space. This could also look like a school or a uh, lunchroom or a college cafeteria. How are we going to do that? Uh, we may need to do some other things intermittently if we if we start getting spread. Uh, uh, and like uh, Aaron Bromage said in his article, if you don't solve the biology, the economy won't recover, but we can take advantage of the biology. 
Uh, so one of the more interesting articles that came out a couple days ago was the four day on, 10 day off uh, approach. So if we started getting a little more community spread uh, after we open up, we won't, might not have to necessarily close for weeks at a time, but we actually just could do a four day on, 10 day off cycle. So Monday through Thursday would work, Friday you'd go home uh, for the weekend, and the next week you'd work from home or you'd do school from home for the next week, and then bat repeat again the following week. And so by doing this, you would actually interrupt the spread because the cycle of the virus is about 14 days. So that first four days when you're at work, even if you started spreading around, if anybody got sick, stay home. And then 10 days off, we'd actually start limiting the spread. Things would, if you got sick, you wouldn't come back to the work, but everybody else who didn't get sick that 10 days, they could come back to work. So we could use this. So, so for example, on our health department's website, there's this uh, low, high, moderate risk uh, that they use uh, similar to air quality or, air, or pollen. They're using this for coronavirus, and I think it makes a lot of sense. We could actually use that uh, as a way to monitor ourselves and decide whether to open or close. So if we have low spread, uh, we could do regular activities and go back to work and go back to school, but continue masking, physical distancing, and hand washing. We had just started to get the first hint of some spread. We could flip, flip to a four day on, 10 day off cycle for a couple cycles and if that stops it we could go right back to work again or if it got high of course we we'd have, may have to do all at home for a while. Uh, we know that uh, most epidemics and pandemics spread and have multiple waves so hopefully we will have kept our wave not too bad this first time in Nebraska. Uh, we still don't know for sure yet until we get a little more testing of course but when we start opening it back up if we did that four to ten day cycle we could actually have really brief shutdowns that actually might work short of having to you know close for four and eight and twelve weeks like we're doing right now. So I think this might actually work. Uh, so also this is going to require though uh, some mask wearing in, in, in the workplace and so maybe we need to start uh, making this compulsory uh, similar to, to no shirt, no shoes, no service that, that's typical at restaurants and grocery stores already. Why not just do no mask, no service? Uh, it really doesn't take that much. The evidence is really solid and literally this could be one of the biggest interventions with almost no cost that really would limit spread. So hopefully this is helpful to uh, We keep putting the, the, web, the uh, videos on healthylincoln.org website. Uh, like I say, uh, I don't necessarily get approval of everybody I work with to say this because I can't do it every three days. I think most agree, but, uh, but not everybody, of course, probably. But this is all the places I work, so you realize, you know, I do have a day job as a physician and a public health person, and I do, I'm an elected official uh, working with our school boards uh, on this.